here. So, okay, so hopefully, uh, can you see my uh, slides there? First one? Yep, looks good. Okay, all right, um, so um, as Steve said, um, my name is Rick Toman, and I work as the Climate Science and Services Manager for National Weather Service Alaska Region. Um, now you might be wondering what, um, what a climate science and services manager within the weather service uh, might do. And um, uh, not surprisingly, like many of you, I wear multiple hats, but what I wanna to talk to you about uh, today is uh, some of the climate monitoring activities that, um, that we do here. And specifically, as it, um, as it feeds, uh, you know, one of the weather services, you know, primary goals, um, protection of life and property. And so uh, some of my work involves um, putting um, ongoing or forecasted events into, into some kind of historical context. That's often important for extreme events, uh, being able to relate uh, ongoing or expected events uh, to uh, events that have occurred in the past. This uh, is particularly important in Alaska, where we have uh, very little um, and, and pretty sparse and often short uh, data records of the traditional uh, science-y type things. So, um, you know, for instance, coastal storms, it's often of most use to be able to uh, reference uh, this storm. We expect to be similar to something that occurred in you know, some previous year because for most communities, um, there is no uh, hard science data uh, that we could reference. So um, uh, this is just an example of some of the stuff that I work on it's, uh, that I regularly do. And um, it's all basically to, uh, to help uh, both uh, the Weather Service and our partners um, uh, with, uh, with uh, their concerns. Okay. Oops, there we go. Okay, so um, this is kind of a hodgepodge of stuff I do. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, Steve asked me to talk about a few different things, so this uh, uh, came up, so um, we'll just jump right in. Uh, start off with just some recent highlights for those of you not in Alaska, kind of bring you up to speed, show you some of the, the products um, that, um, that I work with. And, uh, and then um, I think of potentially of quite an interest um, to the terrestrial uh, group. Um, freezing rain in the Arctic during the winter time uh, is, um, as I have there, is um, a serious pain. And um, there's been uh, quite a bit of uh, freezing rain uh, in Alaska recently. And so um, take a look at both um, some uh, historical work we've done, again, putting things in context, and then also uh, uh, just a slide on statewide project projections, uh, how this might change through the 21st century again might be of interest to you guys. And then the data set that I want to talk about will be um, uh, NCI's uh, Alaska Climate Division's data set. Um, it's just a couple years old now and um, is actually uh, quite valuable for us. Um, if you haven't seen it uh, and you're doing work in Alaska, uh, might be a potential use to you. Okay, so uh, recent climate highlights. Uh, I, won't, uh, I won't read the, uh, the screen there. Uh, you can read the graphic yourself, but I do want to highlight um, while uh, 2017 has not been as extreme as uh, some years, like to say last year, as we'll see, uh, temperature wise, um, the, quite a number of notable records um, during the, especially the summertime. You can see uh, in the uh, kind of the central interior there, three of our uh, long term. Uh, climate sites had not just their warmest July, but their warmest month of record um, in July. Um, again, you know, place like uh, Tanana has uh, records going back uh, to the to the 19 aughts. So uh, really, quite uh, quite uh, remarkable. And uh, up at uh, Ukiarik, um, they didn't have their warmest month of record, but had their warmest July of record. Um, really quite quite remarkable. In spite of the warmth, uh, uh, wildfire season was actually very close to the uh, to the uh, quarter century median value at 653,000 acres. And the southeast got into the uh, the heat this summer too, uh, with um, uh, Skagway um, 
34C, uh, 93 Fahrenheit on August 5th. That was actually the warmest temperature recorded in the state uh, this past summer. And uh, Skagway actually has uh, reasonable climate data, not all at the same site, but um, uh, pretty decent records uh, back uh, to the 1800, 1898. And um, that 93 uh, Fahrenheit is the highest of record there. Um, I actually had to scrounge to find anything cold to put on uh, the kind of the recent climate highlights, but uh, last week Cold Bay uh, did have their um, uh, minus 7C, and that's actually the lowest temperature of record uh, so early in the season by one day. So um, generally, um, you know, continuing the theme that we've been seeing for, of course, quite some time in Alaska, uh, the highlights warmth dominated on the climate scale. Uh, weather scale, um, although I didn't put any weather type highlights really on here, of course, significant uh, storminess uh, this year uh, in Western Alaska and uh, in September, uh, $10 million worth of damages from uh, uh, coastal erosion and flooding up at Utkiagvik. So, um, uh, and that's of course directly related to that loss of sea ice and the lack of sea ice at the end of September. So here's a, uh, here's a product that um, we came up with. One of the most common questions I get uh, in, my, uh, in my job is, oh, well, you know, what's it like in Alaska? And after about a million times of saying, well, you know, Alaska is a big place and, you know, where, are you interested in a specific spot? Um, we dreamed up this idea uh, to develop this uh, daily temperature index. And so um, we use 25 um, uh, weather service sites. Uh, you can see down there in the little, uh, little map there uh, is the sites we use. We pick these to try to be aerially representative and, um, and then just generate um, uh, standardized anomalies and put it into a nice index here. So uh, it goes from minus 10 to plus 10, zero means uh, that on the statewide scale would be exactly normal. And you can see in 2016, um, really a, a very remarkable uh, time series there. Um, you know, if, uh, if you think that uh, on average, you know, about half the days ought to be warmer than normal and half cooler than normal, obviously we were very, very far from that in uh, 2016. In fact, uh, multiple people asked me what, or told me that I must be doing something wrong with the calculations here, that um, it can't possibly look like this. But um, I'm pretty sure the math's all right. Uh, whether, the, um, whether the methodology is right maybe is a debate, but the math is right and it's really quite uh, 2016, very remarkable for the persistence of the warmth. Um, go to 2016, okay, now the math looks better. Um, and compared to 2016, 2017, um, you know, there's, there's episodes of below normal, but still uh, when we add them all up, um, you know, the year is, continues to run uh, quite mild, uh, most recently here, uh, very mild stretch the last uh, several days uh, across the state. So again, so this is a tool that um, we've come up with in, a, in an effort to uh, answer a very common inquiry from our from our uh, our stakeholders as well as uh, especially uh, national media uh, so uh, we can give some kind of uh, a quantitative answer to uh, well has it been warm in Alaska has it been cold in Alaska so uh, this we came up with this um, another important thing that uh, we monitor here in, in Alaska is uh, ocean temperatures and um, of course, um, these are ocean temperatures, but uh, of course, immediately relevant to uh, what happens on the land. And uh, so this is some um, graphics here with some uh, a software that Brian Brechneider, a postdoc at UAF has ginned up. And this takes, in this particular case, this takes NOAA's extended reconstruction uh, sea surface temperature database, which uh, goes back into the 1850s and uh, takes, the, uh, takes the grid point by grid point values and ranks them. Uh, so this is a, a very handy way to look at this. People uh, uh, can relate to this very much. And I've got three successive uh, warm seasons up there, 2015 on the left, uh, 2016 in the middle, and most current on the right. And you can see that um, 2015 and 16, uh, very warm, uh, a fair amount of fire engine red on there. Uh, that's the warmest in the entire data set, uh, even in 2017, which saw closer to, um, to middle rankings. Uh, 
in the Gulf of Alaska and parts of the Southern Bering Sea up through the Bering Strait. Um, again, a warmest of record. Um, I don't think Brian has any uh, code to do this at the moment, but you can see that if you asked, well, in the last three years, what percentage of the waters uh, around Alaska south of the Bering Strait have had their highest uh, observed uh, summer SSTs, uh, it would obviously be a fair chunk of, uh, of the water. So really uh, quite, uh, quite remarkable uh, uh, ocean temperatures here recently. Sea ice, of course, is very important. Um, as you all know, you know, Arctic wide sea ice tends to get a lot of play, um, especially the minimum. Uh, in Alaska, where, you know, the sci you know, I kind of think of the Arctic minimum, that's a scientifically interesting parameter, but it's not actionable item by most users. Uh, in Alaska, um, what we really ca care about is um, the seasonally ice uh, uh, in the wintertime uh, in the Bering Sea, uh, in Cook Inlet, uh, in the summertime, uh, the timing and extent that the uh, ice in the Chukchi and Beaufort uh, retreats. And so um, in recently here, um, National Snow Ice Data Center has a, a couple of um, uh, new data sets out uh, that uh, regionalize uh, some of the, um, that Arctic uh, ice information. And so um, this is a plot, this is from the MAZI database uh, the Maisie database is actually just the digitized analysis by the um, National Ice Center. And um, you can see here, uh, 2017 uh, in, uh, in the darker line there, uh, quite comparable uh, with recent years. The minimum was not quite as low this year as, um, as last year, but uh, uh, for the uh, combined area, uh, very low. And um, I don't have it here, but if you look at the uh, passive microwave, data, which is now available in this same regionalized uh, extent database. Uh, 2017, of course, is far, far lower than um, either the, um, the uh, pre-2000 uh, era. No surprise there. Okay, you're going to flip over now to uh, the freezing rain, and this was very uh, handy here in Fairbanks. Uh, significant freezing rain event yesterday. And um, it really is the scourge of uh, inland Alaska. Um, you know, most of mainland Alaska is pretty well adapted to, uh, you know, heavy snow we can handle. Uh, 40 below in Fairbanks is just another winter day. Uh, but freezing rain is really, uh, really a problem. And uh, it's uh, more than a problem than you might think of if, uh, say, you're in um, in DC, uh, where you certainly get uh, episodes of freezing rain. In interior Alaska, when free freezing rain falls early in the winter, uh, because of the low sun angle and uh, generally far below freezing temperatures, freezing rain can stick around the entire winter. And uh, it's a sad reality that uh, uh, in the past several years, we've had freezing rain events that have occurred in November and they were the proximate cause for fatal car accidents in March uh, because uh, on the less traveled roads, um, that ice just simply is gonna persist until uh, the spring thaw. So um, very high freezing rain inland Alaska, very high societal impact. Um, it's actually become recently, say the last decade, become common enough that there's been changes in societal preparations. For instance, the Alaska Department of Transportation is changing the way that, uh, that uh, it handles uh, ice on roads. Uh, Fairbanks North Star School District uh, didn't used to build in any snow days uh, into their calendar. Um, you know, snow is snow, we're used to that. Cold is cold, we're used to that. But there's been enough freezing rain now that they're starting to build in extra days into their calendar because if school is gonna be canceled, uh, that is almost, almost certainly the only reason it would be, would be because of freezing rain, not snow or cold. So, um, of course, the question comes up, um, we've had this spate of freezing rain events recently. Um, is this a sign of uh, environmental change? Um, what does this look like in the past? So, uh, Fairbanks is kind of nice. Uh, freezing rain is rare uh, during the winter time. Uh, so it's actually tractable to attempt to develop some kind of uh, historical database. This would be 
extremely labor intensive to do for, for Anchorage, say, where uh, this kind of thing is much more common. Uh, but if we do this, um, it's, this is very interesting. Uh, this is a plot. And uh, so I, uh, I picked out here uh, winter rain events, so winter, November through March, uh, greater than a tenth of an inch, so two and a half millimeters of rain during this period. You can see uh, this on the, uh, on the bottom uh, right-hand side there, the spate of recent events. Um, and then the green line there is, are just the, the uh, summed events per uh, decade for running 10 years. And you can see that um, while we've had a big uptick here recently in these events, just like everyone uh, uh, that lives here knows, um, this is not unprecedented. There was, a, there was also a spike in the uh, 1960s and then especially in the 1920s and 30s. Now, I, I do have to say, I use that threshold of one-tenth of an inch of precipitation of rain, um, not because that's, soci that's societally or, um, uh, or necessarily uh, uh, ecosystem important. Rather, that threshold basically allowed me to pick out the rain events in the older data when we don't have high time resolution um, and, it, and prior to World War II. Um, at best, um, a couple of observations a day, and um, in the, uh, the pre-1930 data, um, really you just have one observation a day. So that threshold was just picked out as to allow um, uh, this work to proceed, not because that's a high impact. In fact, societal impacts occur much, uh, much lower amounts. So the important uh, message here, I think, for the, uh, for the uh, for IARPIC uh, terrestrial group is at least in uh, one part of the central interior of Alaska, uh, there's been a recent uptick, but it's not unprecedented. Um, there's clearly been periods in the past when we've had this kind of thing. Some of the, uh, some of the winters in the 1930s, were they to occur now, would um, be catastrophic uh, with the amount and frequency of uh, freezing rain. So um, a nice, um, I think this is a nice, uh, uh, application of, of kind of putting our current, uh, current uh, weather and climate conditions into that historical context. Now, of course, uh, many of you might be more interested in, uh, well, what's the, what's the future going to bring? And there's been uh, some work on this. It's uh, actually quite difficult uh, to, uh, to model uh, freezing rain because of the importance of, uh, of what's going on right at the surface, which, of course, uh, large-scale climate models uh, don't, uh, don't handle. But uh, in recent years, of course, with downscaling, uh, can make cons considerable progress. Uh, Steph McAvee, uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, and, and co-authors uh, uh, published a paper on this, and uh, uh, Peter Beniak at UAF and, um, and some others of us uh, work at, got a paper in press right now on this. And this is a graphic uh, showing uh, the trend in rain on snow days uh, for during the, um, the rest of the, uh, the 21st century. Now, rain on snow is not exactly the same as uh, freezing rain. Uh, this is just basically a uh, downscale uh, rain when there is snow on the ground um, and without uh, consideration of the actual air temperatures. So uh, this does include, for instance, um, you know, a low number of rain events in, say, April when there, the winter snowpack is not uh, melted out yet. But uh, in general, um, it should give us a pretty good idea. And of course, quite interesting, you can see across Southeast Alaska, as well as most of Southwest Alaska, there's a decreasing trend, the blue colors there. And uh, um, that, is, that, of course, is the result of um, fewer days with snow on the ground at all. Uh, freezing rain um, and rain on snow is not uncommon now in Southwest Alaska. And uh, the, the expectation from these models would be in the future that uh, there'd be uh, uh, less rain on snow because there's less snow uh, on the ground, less days with snow. But over most of the state, uh, quite a large uh, increase, especially in Northwest Alaska, uh, where, for instance, uh, rain on snow events um, are of great interest in uh, their effect on, uh, on caribou. Okay. Uh, running out of my time here. So jumping now over to Alaska Climate Divisions. 
Um, if you're not familiar with these, um, uh, this enabled uh, Alaska to jump right into the 1950s uh, when it comes to regional climate uh, monitoring. Uh, Alaska had climate divisions, but they weren't really used at all by, uh, by really for any of the purposes that they are used for down south. Uh, these objectively based divisions were uh, developed by Peter Benyak uh, in 2012, and uh, we went through a lot of hoops, but uh, NCEI implemented these in uh, March 2015. And so um, there's a, actually a lot of confusion with the climate divisions. It's not just, well, you just take the average of all the stations you have. It's not, uh, it's not anywhere near that simple. Uh, NCI is currently, um, they're using uh, many more uh, data points, uh, mostly automated observations, than uh, just the traditional uh, climate stations. Um, the data is updated monthly, it's available as an FTP, uh, and importantly, uh, the data is, is not fixed. In fact, it's in principle never fixed. Um, as uh, new data comes and goes as quality uh, control uh, is done, um, in some cases, uh, non-digitized uh, data sets are added. Um, there, can, there can and are uh, revisions to the data. So it's, it's really a living database. And it does provide regional coverage for temperatures and precip since 1925. Here's, a, here's an aerial plot of what that looks like. Uh, so this is just the summer uh, 2017. I know the, the graphics are, are kind of small. A uh, couple of things just to point out here. Uh, in addition to the uh, staple average temperature, uh, max and mins are also available, mean max, mean min. And uh, this uh, is very interesting. If you'll look in Southeast Alaska, you'll see for max temperatures there, the central, um, the central uh, panhandle zone there is a, a darker shade of blue. Uh, in fact, it was the sixth coolest average max temperature uh, since 1925 there. But look over on the uh, min side, that's the upper, uh, right hand side and you can see it's actually um, that first shade of uh, uh, salmon color there so that's the upper tercile so um, uh, cool days but uh, mild nights uh, compared to the historical record in uh, southern um, in southern southeast I'm sorry in central southeast uh, precipitation on the other hand a lot of uh, near normal this past summer except for the southern panhandle actually the wettest in the uh, 93 years of record. So um, this is a very common use of this data set. Um, here's, here's one, you may have seen this, I've circulated this and showed this. So, so this is just straight off of, the, of their data, they, they uh, NCI's uh, data here. And uh, th so this is the Alaska-wide temperature. So this is the aerially weighted uh, of those climate divisions, not just a straight numeric average. And um, uh, no surprise to anyone. Uh, 2016, uh, the warmest year in this database uh, uh, by a, a long shot and uh, a pretty solid upward trend since the mid-1970s. And then lastly, um, well, there's other ways to slice and dice them. This, this is a, a waffle uh, plot that I put up using all the climate divisions and uh, just this uh, colorized uh, tercile category and see uh, NOAA's uh, Climate Prediction Center Outlooks are done in tercile categories, so um, you know, we often use these just um, for, um, for uh, comparative purposes. And this uh, provides a nice visual. Um, you don't have, to, don't have to look too hard to see uh, since 2013. It's not that Alaska has not, uh, in any place, has not had any uh, monthly scale cool weather, but um, uh, red is uh, obviously by far the dominant color, uh, significantly warmer than normal. Uh, most places, most of the time since uh, 2013 in this plot. And um, again, this is the kind of thing that uh, we, we keep track of, uh, mostly to satisfy our partners and our, uh, our, the media's uh, interests. So that's what I got. Um, if I can help you with anything uh, climate related for, uh, for Alaska, there's my contact info. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rick. Um, I think we'll save questions uh, in the interest of time and see if we have uh, a little bit left over after we hear from uh, Chris Heimstra. But wanted to point out real quick that um, 
Rick is actually on annual leave right now and has uh, come out of hiding to uh, uh, talk with us today. So uh, uh, special thanks for that, Rick. All right, so um, let's go ahead and move on. Our next speaker is uh, Chris Heimstra from Corps of Engineers and the Cold Regions Research and Ecology Lab. Uh, there in Fairbanks, uh, going to be talking a little bit about snow and its role in um, uh, regional ecosystems. But uh, I'm uh, going to guess that, in particular, talking about our, our lack of uh, understanding in, in some areas as to the uh, role of snow in these systems. So, um, once we're ready on that end, uh, let's uh, queue up Chris, please. Okay. So, Rick, um, if you'll click the stop sharing button. And anyone that's got questions for Rick or Chris during the course of Chris's presentation, you can also type them into the chat box as well. Thank you. All right. All right, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. And then do you see uh, the first screen there, the title? Yes. Or, um, okay. Although it, it is in um, presenter mode, so we can see the next slide as well. Okay, let me see. You can fix that. All right, is that better? I'm still seeing the same thing. No, that's actually okay. good. I, yep, I see the full good. thing. Okay, you got it? Yep. All right. Yep. Yep, there's a little bit of a lag there, so. All right, so uh, thanks again. Um, that's it. Thanks, Rick. That was really good to see. Um, uh, so it's, it's interesting to sit, talk about winter processes here, especially um, given the last couple of days. So uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the snow and ecosystem impacts and focus a lot on snow data sets um, and what's out there, which isn't that much um, in ways that it can be used. Um, I've been involved in a number of different things, including like the recently completed Snow X Year One that was focused on uh, Grand Mesa in Colorado. Um, and I know that there's some uh, ongoing discussions about if that, that project is going to be headed up to Alaska potentially or not. Um, I'm also involved in other work um, that is dealing with interior Alaska snowpacks measurements and modeling work. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that today. All right, so um, most of us, uh, you know, talk about snow, you think about uh, uh, precipitation when it falls and not so much about what it looks like when it falls on the landscape um, and what happens when it melts and goes away. Here we have, um, this is a, 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 Jeremy will recognize this from Gnome Creek. Um, I've got a little movie here that shows uh, kind of like a, a little bit of a winter season in time lapse mode kind of a handy way to, to look at snowpack development over time and, and see what happens uh, when you don't have a chance to be there. So here you can see November uh, 2016, this will go all the way th uh, through June 1, 2017. Uh, snow is coming and, and going, falling out of the canopy, uh, pushing some of the canopy down and accumulating over time. You see it build up uh, various animal tracks 
again coming in and out of the canopy. And then uh, in April, it'll, it'll really quickly sort of vanish. Uh, so uh, the, the thing that I want to focus on is that, well, um, a lot of measurements that we have gauge what comes into or falls from the atmosphere into gauges. Uh, what we don't understand very much at all is what it looks like on the ground and what's available on the ground and how snow behaves over time uh, in that. Uh, one thing that's been that I've been working on for quite a while now is uh, with snow model with Glenn Liston. Um, and that the, the model itself is a is a kind of an, an aggregate of a number of models um, that uses uh, more or less meteorological reanalysis data, which includes precipitation, wind direction, wind speed, uh, temperature, relative humidity over terrain um, that it is, entails a, a DEM, as well as uh, the vegetation or land cover. Um, and then it actually evolves the snow over the course of that season uh, to try to understand what it looks like and where it exists on the landscape. Um, this is kind of a parallel effort along with a lot of the remote sensing approaches uh, which uh, uh, various tools and assets are being used including LIDAR, uh, stereo, um, uh, stereo satellite imagery among others, um, but for the most part, there's not one sort of tool that can be used to look at snowpack over time other than presence or absence, which is what most of the focus is on. This is really the only way that we have right now to look at the amount of snow water equivalent or the amount of water that's actually on the landscape and how it behaves and when it, when it arrives and when it goes away. Uh, so one thing I wanted to look at for a while is that there's a, a, an interesting data set out there. It's called snow data um, and it's um, a few years old now, uh, but it ran from 1979 to 2012. And what Glenn did as a part of this work was uh, focused on roughly 60% of Alaska uh, and it, was, it entailed a lot of the boreal parts as well as Arctic Alaska. So it's not the entire state, unfortunately. It used uh, station data and, and NASA mirror reanalysis on a three hourly time step at two kilometer resolution for the state or for the part of the state that's done. Um, it's available online um, and in a lot of ways it's underutilized. It's, it was a great data set, a great um, effort to put this together, uh, but in a lot of ways hasn't been looked at that much. And one thing um, to try to define like how uh, how variable snow is and where it's varying on the landscape um, is a crucial question. And this is kind of the first step to look at that. Um, and so uh, what we have here is the mean 1980-2012 uh, from this data set. This shows you the extent uh, in Alaska that the data set exists for. Um, so and what I'm trying to show here is this is the percent of the total annual precipitation that arrives as snow. Uh, you can see pretty high amounts in especially high elevation areas and farther in the north. Um, and then as you'd expect in the interior and lowlands, uh, you get uh, quite a bit less in terms of the total annual amount. Uh, so this varies uh, quite a bit through space. A lot of it depends on the elevation, um, but you can have some other local effects like south range of the or south parts of the Brooks Range and so on. And here we have the, the mean 1980-2012. Um, this is the first of March snow water equivalent uh, for that uh, reporting. And again, just sort of picking the first of March uh, for most of the analysis um, that's in this talk at least. Uh, just to give you an idea of uh, the spatial heterogeneity here uh, on the landscape. This is over that entire series of, of years and the entire data set. So this isn't... Uh, so now we'll shift gears a little bit and then talk about like how much does this change from year to year. So if you look at just a standard deviation even, uh, now you get a little more of a sense of higher elevations where you get more snow. There's also more variability in that snow and at lower elevations and or farther north, uh, especially toward the Arctic coast, you don't get that much of a shift uh, from year to year. And much of the areas in between, uh, the most dominant one is about three to five uh, centimeters of SWE from year to year of swings. 
So, and trying to think of ways that how do you define, um, how do you look at when something has less than what you'd expect or, or drought? I mean, there's various definitions of drought um, and kind of toying around with the idea of how do you define or analyze uh, what is in snow drought versus not. Uh, one of the ways is to look at the 80th percentile. One of the ways is to, um, and what I did here is even simpler than that, just trying to look at any areas that are reporting less than the 80th, 80% uh, 80 of the mean. Uh, so it's a fairly conservative estimate. Here we have uh, 1993, again, the first March SWE. And all you can see uh, that's red. So any, any place that's reporting less than 80% of the mean is highlighted in red. 1993, um, pretty much everywhere snowpack wise in the state is, um, is above that by far. Um, and in contrast, you see uh, 2010 uh, showing you a little bit of an indication of a year where it's the opposite, where most of the areas are reporting as below uh, the mean for that particular date. So if you actually go through the entire record from uh, 1980 through 2012, and then aggregate them all together. So basically any time it has below that 80% mark, that's considered a hit. And then you sum all those together where uh, there is uh, just a few locations where 17 of the years uh, it reported below average according to the model. And then you can aggregate that and get a little more of an idea of uh, for the northern two thirds of the state where snow tends to be uh, have a shortage at least uh, almost half of the time for this short record. And again, uh, interior Alaska seems to be a place where this happens more frequently than others um, and, and part of the coastal areas as well. I'm um, talking a little bit more. Um, we've got uh, fire impacts. Um, surely, and I know the, the research is still uh, up in the air on this in a lot of ways, but you know, fire impacts are probably a combination of winter and more likely summer precipitation issues. Um, and one of the things I wanted to bring up in this is that the fire changes the landscape quite a bit. We've talked a lot about permafrost and thermokarst impacts that happen post fire, which are interesting in and of themselves. But there's also the canopy aspects of what happens after a fire. So on the left, we have a canopy that's uh, you know, upright, normal black spruce trees. On the right, you just have burned uh, post-fire image. So you've got pretty dramatic uh, differences in the amount of sublimation coming off of there, the amount of shortwave radiation encountering the snowpack, and so on and so forth. So it's the canopy snow interaction afterwards, post-fire, um, that can lead to pretty decent changes in the amount of snow as well. Um, and given the amount of area that's burned in the state, in the past, it's definitely something worth exploring uh, to see what that impact is on snowpack, um, not just snowpack impact on fire processes. Uh, we all know um, pretty well that you, your snow depths here on the on the left axis, snow depths in centimeters versus a distance along transect. These are transects from uh, just outside of Fairbanks at the Farmers Loop sites. Um, so. Uh, the snow measurements have been going on there for years at different times of the year. And snow depth can vary quite a bit depending on which uh, vegetation area you're in and the canopy interception, just like we saw in the video, uh, canopy, especially at ground canopy, you can have a big role in forming those voids and things that form at that surface that are crucial for, uh, for insulation and protecting that surface or protecting the soil from uh, dramatic changes in atmospheric temperature or, or not in the case of when the snows tend to show up later and uh, that soil is exposed to the atmosphere for a prolonged time, especially with late snowpack arrival. Um, there, most of you are familiar with the, the permafrost distributions, Alaska permafrost dominated Snow has a huge role in what that temperature regime is there in permafrost areas. So it's the time of the arrival and how that snow um, either insulates or the lack of snow doesn't insulate the ground surface uh, can be a pretty important aspect. And I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the uplands. So you've got 
Uh, some morphology issues too that are cropping up. In 2014 uh, was an amazingly wet year. That started a lot of uh, initiation of some uh, thermokarst events. This is from an area that's outside Fairbanks at Fox above the permafrost tunnel. Uh, we've had LIDAR there that was done uh, pre pre-summer 2014 and then another collection done in 2016 uh, where you difference those and see the changes in the landscape at the surface level. And then uh, once these areas are identified, you go on the ground there and take photos and you can see a pretty dramatic thermocarsting in spots. Uh, on the top right, um, there's a lot of silt deposition in some um, areas where the water slows down. And then on the bottom left, you see the uh, sort of textbook drunken trees or falling forest uh, that's happening because of the thermocarsting erosion. This creates um, further division in the landscape and in windy areas, these places can fill in with snow fast. Uh, there's also off ice issues that uh, we've seen cropping up here. So there's some various cryosphere stories uh, that are starting to, to appear uh, given this uh, change. And this is a summer, primarily a summer um, modulated impact, but um, likely uh, cryosphere influences following on that as well. And uh, just to round it out a little bit, talk about Arctic work. Um, a lot of this the landscapes here also depended on snow and snow has a tremendous influence on the soil temperatures, especially in the somewhat low lying areas. Even though your, your topographic relief is sub meter total, those areas, those ice wedges, um, which are green in the summer photo, tend to fill in with snow really fast and that insulates that ground where the upland parts of those polygons are, are less protected by that and, are, and tend to be colder over time. So snow movement on this landscape is pretty crucial in terms of controlling temperature. Um, and uh, with a snow story changing over time uh, with either varying amounts or the timing of that uh, can have a big impact. And with that, that's, uh, that's what I'd like to talk about. If, uh, Hopefully we'll have time for some questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, we've got just a couple of minutes uh, before we uh, run out of time at noon Alaska. Uh, so if uh, you have any questions for either Rick or Chris, uh, I, we, we can go ahead and uh, try to get to a few of those now. So a uh, question for Chris then, um, if you have any particular insights you could share on the prospects of, of bringing the, the Snow X type uh, work to Alaska, uh, any, uh, um, any, anything that, that you, you know of that you can share with the group on that? Well, I, I know that there's a, um, there are a few folks that are involved in the in that Snow X team, and what right now is happening is that there's a they're at a very formative process uh, where I think they met for the first time like yesterday, um, and I know that they're well aware of the above efforts uh, and vice versa, and there's probably a natural uh, chance for collaboration there. Um, but that where they want to go with that funded PI team um, that again just met yesterday is I'm not sure I wasn't a part of that uh, discussion so um, but I, I think that's open for that I think if people who want to see that work done in Alaska um, I definitely would make that known uh, to those folks and, and I can let you know who they are um, what we've tried to do, we made a strong push for Alaska involvement a few years ago, and we came in in second place, more or less, um, because of that interest and in that, uh, and because it's where the snow was changing, and it's also was one of the key issues was what the impact of, uh, of trees and canopy was on snowpack, and uh, without addressing the boreal forest, um, which is a pretty available, easy resource here. Um, it, it came pretty close, but didn't happen. Um, but I think the, the interest is definitely still there. And, uh, you know, Fairbanks is a pretty easy place to work in the winter in spite of what some people thought um, about it when it happened. But 
some of the sites that we've talked about or I've talked about in this, uh, we have offered up, they have line power, easy access, um, and it's and a, and a decent snow record and meteorological data. So um, we've been willing partners in hosting some of this. Um, but um, I think that, you know, making inroads with the, the rest of the SnowX team and telling them uh, come to Alaska is, is a good way to, to start that ball rolling. Uh, hello, guys. This is this is Elton Jaffer. I have a question for Rick, but that's somehow also related uh, with snow and what Chris talked about. So first, uh, about the daily temperature index, I think that's a pretty cool uh, metric, and it would be nice as a, a permafrost scientist and a permafrost hydrologist know. It would be nice to see, or maybe there, you know, I guess my. So first of all, like, <laughs> is there? You said that there is a paper in publication about the daily temperature index. Is it already published? Hi. Um, so no, we don't have a paper on the daily temperature index yet. I am trying to figure out how to get that publicly available, um, and I think maybe um, okay. maybe Western uh, Region Climate Center may be able to ho host it. I did, I did do a presentation at the Applied Climate, uh, AMS Applied Climate Workshop uh, on that um, in June. I'd be happy to send you the slides for that if you'd like the um, technical details. Yeah, that would be nice. Uh, also, um, you measure the air temperature. It would be nice to get the uh, measurements on the ground surface temperature because then we could use what Rick talked about, uh, you know, how snow exactly uh, plays uh, on the sort of offset, the, the difference between the, you know, the ground surface temperature and the air temperature. And then we will be able to more clearly to see, okay, how snow depths affects the offset or, or vice versa, you know, those kind of analysis. And those kind of analysis will be extremely cool for, I think, for people who are doing soils and permafrost and hydrology. Is there, is there a way to get your hands on the ground surface temperatures? So some, this is Rick, um, some of the NRCS snow tell sites do have some kind of, of uh, ground temperature or soil temperatures. Um, that's what I know of as far as publicly available. Of course, there's research data sets, but for near real time, as far as I know, the NRCS sites that have that are what we've got in Alaska. There's also permafrost sites, USGS and Vladimir, they both have uh, ground surface temperatures. Right, right. Okay, thank you. Hey, Elchin, this is, this is Chris. I, I... Uh, we've done a little bit of work on that above the tunnel and at Farmer's Loop, um, and we're uh, trying to get some funding to actually look at doing snow manipulations and addressing that in an experimental way of, uh, of having temperature sensors there and then changing the snowpack or by interception or addition uh, to see what happens. Um, but that's, we haven't been able to garner funding for that one yet. Yeah, that will be nice to see. And when I looked at the product that you guys did with the Glen um, modeling snow, uh, it would be nice, you know, if we have those ground temperatures, since we have now the air temperatures and daily indexes, maybe we can develop some sort of, a, a, or better understand, you know, the interaction between snow and uh, offsets. Right. 